Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 132, Working on the Railroad, Next Step Train Games from Ticket to Ride. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Tonight, we are going to continue our topic of train games that started last week. Uh, we've got a question from someone looking for next step train games from Ticket to Ride. Sticking with the topic of railway gaming, I've got a review of the most unique train game I have ever played. That's Rail Pass, a real-time cooperative pickup and deliver train game. Once we get to the week in review, we do go off the rails with some initial thoughts on the production version of Garinto and the Crystal Mosaic expansion for Azul, and some more thoughts on Rail Pass that I finally got to the table with my entire family. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Our first comment comes from Chris Groff and is on our Trap Words unboxing video. I bought this game thinking it would be a good family group game a few years ago, and after reading through the rules, I just can't get excited enough to play it. It <laughs> feels like a fun underlying game, and then the rules try and put in as many obstacles as possible to prevent you from playing. Been on my sell list for a while. Well, thanks for the comment, Chris. Uh, now, I personally haven't gotten a chance to play this game uh, due to the lockdown, emergency, break, stay at home, whatever we're in now in Ontario. And it needs a minimum of four players to play. So that's just not something that can happen right now. But based on what I've seen other people say about the game and based on my own impression reading the rules, I think it's at least giving it a shot before you get rid of it. I, I can't see getting rid of it based on the rules. Now they did seem a bit overly complicated for a word-based party game where you're trying to grasp a clue and not use the secret words the other teams guess. That's kind of the whole concept. But I watched a couple how to play videos and I just think the rule book was bad at explaining it. And it just made it seem overly complicated. It seems like it works really well at the table. So again, I'm I just being positive here, I guess. I haven't gotten a chance to play it, but I'm definitely not getting rid of my copy before I at least try it. All right, well, while the Kickstarter for Mercury Games 18 cash and 18 shares chips ended unfunded, we thought these comments were worth sharing, one pointing out what may be the reason these weren't as popular as Mercury hoped. Now, Top Shelf wrote, The weight of the cash ship chips is actually 9.5 grams per chip. J5 <laughs> Design is the best in the industry when it comes to chip design. And Paul Campo commented, at one point, you said you're not an 18xx gamer, but you can see the value in the share chips. I will say, as someone who is an, eight, is an 18xx gamer, I don't see the value. A stack of chips is harder to read than a splayed array of cards. Oftentimes, players will stack their share dividends on top of their share certificates, and in games where there are two or three rounds of dividends between stock rounds, players will often uh, stack each round of dividends side by side. That won't be possible on a, sh on a share chip, so you'll either have to clear the dividends each round or end up with very tall stacks of chips by the end of the set of rounds. Additionally, they provide no storage solution for the oversized chips, and you'll need to remember to sort out all the required companies for whichever game you're playing before heading out to game night. Overall, in 18xx circles, these 18 shares have consistently been referred to as solutions in search of a problem. And I can't say I disagree. Well, thanks for the comments, Top Shelf and Paul. Uh, starting with Top Shelf's comment, yeah, I realized far too late that I typoed in the show notes and I read them off and said 4.5 grams and not 9.5 grams. But at this point, it was too late to fix and then Sean couldn't go over and put an overlay or anything like that. Now, I think I corrected myself when I was comparing them to the Iron Clays saying they were heavier, but I'm not sure. So that was my bad. They are 9.5 grams. Now, the other comment from Paul is definitely more interesting. Now, first off, before I get too deep into this, I said I'm not much of an 18xx gamer. Not that I've never played one. I own and have played 1830 as well as a bunch of 18xx adjacent winsome train games. Now, I will admit, I am not an 18xx expert, so I am glad that you did take the time to comment, Paul. 
Now, regarding the dividends, now Mercury specifically noted to me that they thought the chips made dividends easier to do by stacking the cash on top of the shares. But that sounds like that's not the case with multiple rounds of dividends. So I wonder if that's something more common in one 18xx game than another. If Mercury was thinking it'd be great in this game, meanwhile, you're saying in other games, it's not. Now, I got to say you're right on the storage solution. That is definitely an issue, especially if you own multiple 18x games, 18xx games and want to use the chips for all of them. What are you going to do to store these chips? Now, it does seem that the 18xx crowd did feel these were a solution looking for a problem as the Kickstarter didn't fund. Though I do think a part of that may also be that without a con season or local game stores being open, there wasn't a way for people to actually touch and see these chips in person. And they're the kind of thing that I think you need to hold in your hands to actually see the weight of. Now, Mercury has mentioned they may try to fund these again sometime in the future with more marketing. And hopefully after more people have actually gotten to see the chips and maybe that'll do better for them. Or perhaps there's not just a market for them. And I've got to say, this is the perfect example of Kickstarter working as it should. Now, it's interesting to hear from Paul on these products because as well, the Kickstarter presentation made sense to me as to how to use them and work with the dividends. If that's not how people actually play the game, well, mm. then it might not be the right product. Now, next, a comment on our D&D Adventure Begins review on YouTube that isn't really about the review itself. Orbital Bliss commented, thanks for the review. What are you folks using for transcription? Well, we're currently using Web Captioner. That's at webcaptioner, one word, dot com, and importing that into OBS so it shows up on our live stream here. Um, and then the live stream is just ported to YouTube, so we're not actually using like the YouTube transcription or anything like that. Uh, we use Web Captioner because it's free and it's web-based, so it just kind of runs in the background while we're doing this. Overall, it seems to be working pretty well, but not great. I got to say, it definitely seems to understand Sean better than my me. Though it did teach me I don't seem to enunciate very well and often talk too fast for it to keep up. Sadly, while we both felt it was important to help accessibility by including captions, mm -hmm. it's still a pretty narrow market for the low slash no budget. And, and we're certainly not able to explore some of the more powerful mm -hmm. but paid options out there. Overall, though, besides some comical moments, Web mm -hmm. Captioner has been a strong, flexible, zero-cost solution. Now, with that, I figured this was a great comment to finish off with. Steve Somewhere commented on our Ask the Bellhop segment on engine, engine building games on YouTube to say, this is really interesting to listen to. Thanks. Also, the auto subtitle sometimes puts its own bits in. Perhaps brighten up and write hip salutely. Good <laughs> stuff. Subscribed. It's, yeah, it sounds about right. Or, well, sounds about wrong. It does sound like what the web captioner tends to do. Uh, thanks a lot for the comment, Steve, and even more so for the sub. Uh, speaking of which, we don't do this very often on the show anymore, so maybe it's a time to call it out. If you are watching us on YouTube, take a second right now and pound that subscribe button, and also consider dinging the bell next to it to get notified when we put up new content. About 90% of the people who watch our videos aren't subscribed, mm -hmm. and we can certainly do a little bit better than that. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. One quick announcement before we continue on to our main topic. With all the train game talk this week and last, I think we found the perfect game for us to give away next. It's very fitting with tonight's topic and fits in well with the Age of Steam. While some people may debate whether this game is a train game at all, check out last week's show for our feelings on that, we've decided to give away a copy of the digital version of Ticket to Ride on Steam. With most of the world still stuck in some form of a lockdown and I global disruptions to shipping routes and people not necessarily being able to get new games, and if they can, they can't get together with their friends, we figured this was the perfect time to pass on some Steam codes we've collected in order to let people keep gaming, even if they can't get together in person. Based on how our last giveaway went, we've decided to shorten this one to only two weeks instead of three. The giveaway is live now on the blog and will continue to run until May the 26th, We'll announce the winner the week after on our live show, June 2nd. 
Now for this giveaway, again, we are offering up one Steam key for Ticket to Ride from Asmodee Digital, which will be delivered by email once the contest ends. Since we won't be shipping anything, I'm happy to say this contest is open worldwide. To enter, just head over to tabletopbellhop.com or find a link to this contest in the show notes. Good luck. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight, we've got a topic from our honorary Tabletop Bellhop patron and now published author, Sean Hamilton. Not Sean from Hamilton, which is me, and it sounds weird when I say it. Yeah. Now, Sean asks, what would you recommend as a next step up from Ticket to Ride, insofar as train-themed games? Got someone I know who's super into trains, so looking for potential surprises. Well, thanks so much for the question, Sean. All right, before we get into game recommendations, I do want to discuss one thing. Sean is looking for next step train games from Ticket to Ride. And to properly give suggestions, we need to know what games are considered train games. Well, this episode is actually part two in a series of podcasts where we're talking train games. And I encourage everyone who's interested in deep diving this and figuring out what people mean by train game, check out last week's episode. That's episode 131, Train Spotting. Or at least check out the AMA, or sorry, at the AMA, the Ask the Bellhop segment from that show over on YouTube. Like we really dive, dive into the topic and look at it from another different angles, as well as questioning people on social media and get as many definitions as we can, and eventually settle on a single definition, which is what we'll be using tonight. For those who haven't had a chance to check out that episode, the final answer for us was any game that includes trains, specifically locomotive-style trains, in a meaningful way. Most of these games include mechanics like route building, pick up and deliver, a stock-based economy, contracts to be filled, and or upgrading your tracks and engines. Mm -hmm. Note, most, a given train game may or may not have all of these, as long as it uses trains in some way that's actually important to the game. All right, now that we got that out of the way, it did take a full episode to get there. Uh, let's try to find some great Next Step train games for one of the world's most popular train games and most popular board games, Ticket to Ride. Now, what I'd like to do here is something we did for Settlers of Catan almost two years ago to this day, which I thought was pretty ironic when I looked up the old article, where we talked about games with a similar feel to Catan. So what we did then was take different aspects of Catan that people enjoy and use that to recommend games based on those. For Ticket to Ride, those aspects include things like just playing games and socializing, route building, owning stocks and companies, card-driven mechanics, set collection, and more. As usual, this list is presented in no particular order. Now, my first suggestion, and I end up doing the same thing with Catan, and I don't mean it as a cop-out, is for people who just love Ticket to Ride. Like, I love Ticket to Ride. It's my favorite game. It's a fantastic game. I'm looking for more Ticket to Ride. Well, for that, my strongest suggestion is just that, more Ticket to Ride. Pick up a different version of Ticket to Ride. There are a number of different versions of Ticket to Ride out there, mm -hmm. and many of the later sets have introduced new rules and complexity to the game. Even the first big Ticket to Ride follow-up, Ticket to Ride Europe adds a push your luck element and a way to score your opponent's routes by using stations. So my first recommendation out of the night and that I specifically want to call out is an expansion for Ticket to Ride. So you will need to own Ticket to Ride or Ticket to Ride Europe. It works with both. And this is the Map Collection Volume 5, United Kingdom and Pennsylvania. This expansion features two new ways to play on two new maps that include a number of those train game elements we just mentioned and that we talked about last week that aren't in Basic Ticket to Ride. Now, UK being the first side has a totally new set of train cards and introduces technology cards, which allows player to improve the quality of their trains by discarding engines, which are the wild cards, which allow for faster and longer routes on the map. Now, Pennsylvania uses a deck of stock shares representing actual historical railroads from the 1800s. When player completes a route, they have the option, invest in the company with control of each company giving bonus points at the end of the game. Now, you don't have to invest, but you can. And I've got to say, that sounds a lot like an 18xx game right there. 
So our first suggestion for a next step from Ticket to Ride is more Ticket to Ride <laughs> with the Map Collection Volume 5, United Kingdom and Pennsylvania. Now, my next Ticket to Ride suggestion is a standalone game and is not an expansion, and that's Ticket to Ride Marklin. This is another heavier version of Ticket to Ride, allowing players to not only travel from city to city, but from cities to countries. Now, along with this, there's a pickup and deliver mechanic where each player gets three passengers that can be used to pick up market tokens from the cities on the maps. On a player's turn, instead of drawing cards or placing trains, they can move their passengers. Moving your passenger on your own trains is free, but if you use another player's routes, you need to pay them. And that was Ticket to Ride Marklin. Now, if your group's favorite part of Ticket to Ride is just getting together and mm -hmm. socializing while playing a game, you probably want to stick to lighter games where you can still sit and chat while playing. Games we dig that fit that category include... First up, I have Yardmaster. This is a card game where players are attempting to build the highest valued freight trains by adding rail cars to their existing train yard. Now, when adding cars to your trains, you can only connect cars of the same value or the same good type. Now, the value is represented by a number and these good types are represented by color. Now, similar to like Race for the Galaxy, paying for rail cars costs cards out of your hand. So a big part of the game is trying to decide what cards to use for currency and what to play and what you want in your train yard. Now, taking a step back, there is an even later and shorter version of this game called Yardmaster Express. And this I actually recommend more so as a next step. I actually recommend pick this up. And if you like that, then move on to Yardmaster. This takes the basics of Yardmaster with similar rules for building your trains, but turns into a drafting game like Seven Wonders of Sushi Go. You start your hand with five cards. You put one down in your train yard. You pass your cards to the left. Very similar to that. Now, Yardmaster takes about half an hour. Express can be played under 10 minutes. And that was Yardmaster and or Yardmaster Express. Now, another light game with the train theme is Railroad Inc. This is a roll and write game where players are trying to build both rail and road pathways on a gridded map based on what comes up on a set of custom dice. Now, my favorite part of this game is the fact that everyone is building based on the exact same rolls every round. Yet, by the end of the game, everyone's completed city will look completely different. Note, this game does come in a number of variations. I think they're up to four different ones now. And each of which comes with two unique dice with optional rules. For example, Railroad Inc. Blue comes with blue dice that depict rivers and lakes. Whereas Red is going, I don't know, post-apocalyptic or something because you've got dice with lava and meteors. And that was Railroad Inc. Now, if what your group likes about Ticket to Ride is building the train routes themselves, there are a number of great train games that focus specifically on route building. Transamerica is the lightest game on this list and actually is considered by many to be lighter than Ticket to Ride. So in a way, it's not necessarily a step up, more of a step sideways at best, but it is purely about route building and unconstrained route building. The routes aren't on the map. You just have a bunch of points on the map and you get to build wherever you want. Now, this also could have been placed on the list of games for groups that are more about socializing because this is such a dead simple game. Transamerica, each player starts with five cities on the map and the winner is the first player to connect all five of their cities through anyone's routes, not just your own. Each turn, you have two options and two options only. Place a track or place two tracks. That's it. The key to winning is figuring out how to most take advantage of the rails of your opponents without giving them too much of an advantage using your rails. And that was Transamerica. For something heavier than Transamerica, but still on the lighter side of things, take a look at San Francisco Cable Car often just called Cable Car, and it was also once released as a game called Metro. All of those are the same game. This one is going to appeal to Suro fans. In this game, you control a cable car company with a number of different cars running around the city, and they actually all start on the edge of the board. And your goal is to build the longest possible route for every car using tiles. And these are the type of tiles that Suro has where every tile has two exits on the four sides, and then the rails combination going off one onto the other, and it's every possible combination of that. I know there's a word for this type of tile, but I Googled it and I couldn't figure it out. But there is a tile for type tile type for this so it's that you're putting down tracks you then your rail cars move along the tracks but unlike so you don't actually move them until the end 
to kind of trace the pathway. You don't actually keep your trains on them. Now, the most interesting tier here that completely diverts from Tesoro and makes it a stronger game, and it's also different from most train games where you have to stick your own route. Here, you can place those track tiles anywhere you want. You don't have to build off your own track. This adds a big take that element to the game because you can play on your opponent's cars, basically. Now, Cable Car also includes an advanced mode where players don't actually have a company of their own or a color of their own, rather can invest in stocks in each of the different colors in play. This turns Cable in Car into an almost light 18xx game, though I do recommend playing the original a number of times before stepping up to that. And that was Cable Car or Metro. Now, if you not only like building routes, but building specific routes to match ticket cards in Ticket to Ride, take a look at these. So 20th Century Limited is often considered by many the, the evolution, the next step from Transamerica. It takes the basic mechanics of route building and adds more to it. Players are going to be setting up small railroads, turning them into larger rail lines, and then selling them off to the big train companies and starting over again. And what's neat about this is while players are working on their own little independent rails, there's a card deck that represents the two big rail lines of uh, America at the time period and how they advance along. And if they touch your route, they, they take it over. With this, there's a set of demand cards that work very much like the route cards in Ticket to Ride. And what they show is cities that need to be connected. And if you're able to complete them, you get additional points. So that's a lot of similarities to Ticket to Ride's um, ticket system. So, oh, and that was 20th Century Limited. Now, sticking with the theme of cards, if you dig the card-driven mechanics of Ticket to Ride, along with a bit of route building, take a look at Trains. This is a deck-building game that was released shortly after Dominion. It is very similar to Dominion, including the static market and the, the money cards. Like, they're not coins, but like the very similar mechanics. But it adds one big thing that I, what makes this go on this list is a board. And some of the actions you'll be able to take with some of the cards will involve placing cubes on the board, which represent train routes. And you're going to score points based on getting these routes to connect to cities on the board. And that was trains. Now, if you like the set collection element, so collecting sets of matching car train cards to build routes, if you really love that gin or rummies type aspect of Ticket to Ride, I highly recommend checking out Spike because how you place rails in Spike is almost identical to Ticket to Ride, except the board's open. You can build any direction and your color is what color track you can build on. And each of the five different compass points you can build off of are represented by a different color. So if you want to go up, then left, you might need a red, then a blue card. So you're still trying to get sets of cards to make connections. Now, Spike also adds a very simple market mechanic. There are only four different types of goods. And when you deliver a good to a city, it just bumps to the lowest value. And then they just shuffle over. Like it's a really, really simple mechanic, but it does reward players for delivering different goods. This is honestly my strongest suggestion for people who are like, oh, I don't know what I like about the I like collecting the cards. I like the route building. I like, just kind of generally like it. This is some that, but more to me, this is, is honestly the next step from ticket to ride the open routes and simple economy. Just to me, cinch it as, as one of the strongest suggestions on this list. And that was spike. Next, I want to suggest a bit more of a step up. This is, a, this is possibly taking an elevator to the next floor. And that is my personal favorite route building train games that I personally discovered with the game Steam from Martin Wallace. Now, also in the same category, same style of game, a railroad tycoon, age of steam and railways of the world. Now, the reason for all these variants is due to some dispute over who owns the rights for the games and the particular engine, and there's there's some legal mess there that it, that's from what I understand is all now cleaned up. But these are some of my favorites, and my personal favorite is Steam Rails to Riches by Martin Wallace. These are route building games that also feature a detailed economy featuring auctions and the ability to take loans and a strong pick up and deliver element. Other aspects include improving your locomotives, upgrading cities, and introducing more goods to the market. The Steam game uses an action selection mechanism as well. So all of this made me wonder if maybe this is a bit too much, right? Like th this is, I, I, it's, it's a big step, right? Like I said, but I decided to include this because 
when I think of train games, I kind of think of a scale that starts at Transamerica, maybe Trick to Ride a step up, and goes to the 18xx games. And yes, I realize 18xx games has its own scale built in. But when I think of that, and I try to think of what's right in the middle, what, what is the medium? What's the middle train game that, that that's fairly easy and not too complicated, but still has quite a bit of white weight to it? That's where Steam falls in for me. Note, Steam is slightly simpler than Age of Steam, which is slightly simpler than Railways of the World. So Steam to me is just that perfect middle. So that's why I wanted to include in the list. I do strongly recommend this isn't the game you break out with uh, with grandma and the kids who are used to playing Ticket to Ride. But if you've got a gaming group that's in like Catan, Carcassonne, Ticket to Ride, and are used to a bit more broader gaming experience, I don't think you can go wrong with Steam. And that was Steam and other games based on the early railway series by Martin Wallace, that started with Lancashire Railways. Now, one of the things that most train gamers find is missing from Ticket to Ride is any form of economy or stocks, at least in the base game. While I personally feel those aspects are there just to an abstracted level that people don't recognize them, check out our mm -hmm. last episode for more talk on that. These games feature a stock market-based economy prominently. The most basic stock market trading game I've ever played is Paris Connection. This game is actually really simple to teach and play and is lightning fast. The first time I broke it out, I think we played 11 times in a row. Players each start with a number of random stocks, which are represented by locomotive meeple. And you hide them behind a screen so you don't know who has stock and what. The remaining locomotives are placed on stock cards for the six different companies. Each turn, players place one to five locomotives from a company that's already out there onto the board building that route. And doing that, they're going to increase the value of that company. Or they can trade one of their locomotives in the back with a company that's out there changing up your portfolio. Now, when cities are connected by a completed route and a color, the value of the company goes up. Now, if you think any train game with stocks is too complicated, just give Paris Connection a shot, and I am certain it will change your mind. And that was Paris Connection. Next, I have another winsome game published by Queen, same as Paris Connection, that's a great step up from Paris Connection, and that is Chicago Express. I think of this game as the ultimate gateway to 18xx style train games. It manages to build in most of the major elements of 18xx into a simplified system that plays in under an hour. You've got the auctioning of shares, the expanding of rail systems of any company, developing cities, and even the paying of dividends. Though that's not player driven, it's based on how many actions are taken each round. This is a really brilliant game that was the game that convinced me hey, maybe I might be interested in diving into a heavier World of Rail games. Once you've mastered Chicago Express, look to German Railways, another winsome game from Queen that's another step up mm -hmm. where each different rail line has a special characteristic based on the actual history of those rail companies. And that was Chicago Express and German Railways. Now, lightening things up a bit and stepping away from the winsome early train games and 18xx routes, I've got Whistle Stop. This is a rather unique tile lane game where you are trying to get your trains from one side of the board to the other, east to west. And along the way, you're going to pick up and deliver cargo to small towns. And when you do that, you have the ability to gain shares in other railroads. Or you can hold on to your goods, which will give you a huge payout if you make it all the way to the West Coast with those goods. Now, some stops along the route will provide whistles, which is where the whistle stop name comes in, which will give you special moves and abilities. One thing to watch during this game, though, is make sure you don't run out of coal. While lighter than the Steam games and some of the Winsome games, Whistle Stop manages to cram in a lot of the train game themes into what seems like a simple tile lane game. This is a game where you're going to have a handful of hexes and you're going to put it over a map and your train's going to follow the route you build. This is one I think you have to play at least twice to really get what's going on, but you're going to get the basic mechanics the first time you play. It's pretty simple. Play a tile, move your thing. If your train moves through something, get something for it. That part works, but knowing what you want to get and when is the part where I think you're going to need to play twice to get that learning curve. And that was Whistle Stop. Now, next up, we've got two recommendations that don't really fit neatly because of how different they are. Really, the only thing similar to Ticket to Ride here is that the game features trains. Mm -hmm. But both of these are fairly light, 
family-friendly games that should appeal to fans of Ticket to Ride. Up first, I've got Colt Express. Now, I got to say, this is the one people could argue really isn't a train game, and I wouldn't have much defense here. Despite being about a train heist, the train is more of a backdrop and setting for the game, though it does feature a very cool two-level train that's the main playing board, and there are a couple train long train aspects, like you randomly determine how long each leg of the train run is, and that determines how many actions you get, and there's actually parts, because you're playing cards, where you're in, your train's in a tunnel, and you have to play your cards face down, so no one knows what you're doing, so there are some train elements there, but I, I if someone pushed that this wasn't a train game, I, I wouldn't fight back too hard. Now, in Colts Express, you are playing train robbers in the Old West, where you're using programmed movement to move around the train cards, including climbing up on the roofs, shoot and brawl with your opponents, and try to get to the end of the line with the most cash. That was Colt Express. Finally, I've got Rail Pass, which is one of the most unique train games I've ever played. Now, I'm going to be talking about this one in detail when we get to the review segment later on in the show. This is a pickup and deliver train game where you actually load up plastic trains with cargo cubes, pick them up, and hand them to the other players. This comes in the form of a real-time cooperative semi-dexterity game where players have 10 minutes or less to get cubes from one city to the city matching their color. I found this entire concept to be completely fascinating, and I just had to try this game out for myself. And now that I played it, I now strongly recommend any train game fan at least check this game out. And that was Rail Pass. So that's all the next step train games we can recommend based on games owned and played ourselves. Now next we have a handful of games that come strongly recommended by other people. Discovered while doing research for this topic, but again, we haven't played these ourselves. So first up is a game I really want to try myself called On the Underground. This is a game all about building a different type of train, the subway system in London, England. This is mainly a route building game where players control two to four different lines and will get points for not only connecting their lines to stations and terminuses, but also for having passenger use their rails and where the passengers choose to go every round is determined by a random card deck. And that was On the Underground. Ticket to Ride was designed by Alan R. Moon, and the game he was most famous for before Ticket to Ride was Union Pacific. Now, this is a train-themed stock market game where each round, players decide if they want to expand a company by building routes and adding a stock of that company to their hand, or paying a stock from their hand to the table to increase their ownership of the company. Players have paid dividends on their stocks at semi-random scoring events. Now, I found a number of people strongly recommending checking this out if you're a Ticket to Ride fan. Though personally, taking a look at it on Board Game Geek, it looks a little dated to me. I personally think you might be better off with some of the more modern games we mentioned earlier. Now, interestingly, Alan rethemed and re-released Union Pacific with some updated rules as Airlines Europe which is a non-train game, but I always see people saying, oh, if you like Ticket to Ride, a next step game is Airlines Europe. So I actually think that's probably a better next step game than Union Pacific. So that was Union Pacific and possibly Airline Europe. The other suggestion I saw on every next step train game list, and to be honest, every train game list out there, this listing talking about train games in any way, is the Crayon Rail series of games that all started with Empire Builder from Mayfair Games. Now, I'm ashamed to say I own a copy of this venerable game. Uh, it was my dad's, and I've never actually sat down to learn to play it or tried any other Crayon Rail games, to be honest. Even though I, they've been out at events, like I've had the chance, one of the local gamers loves Martian Rails. Uh, this is something I really probably should rectify at some point. Uh, but despite being an older series of train games, they still seem to have a ton of fans. Well, that was Empire Builder and the various Crayon Rail games. Finally, I have a game that I actually do own that I got for my birthday in January, but unfortunately haven't gotten to play because it requires a minimum of three players. That is Irish Gage. Now this is the first game in a new Iron Rail series from Capstone Games, though it is actually a reprint of an older, again, Winsome Games. Winsome seems to make a lot of these, these simpler dialed down 18xx style games. This seems like a great step up the Ticket to Ride stairs if you're heading towards 18xx games. 
Uh, this came out the exact same time as Chicago Express and Paris Connection and German Railways and has a lot of similarities to those. It features most of the 18 assets aspects without actual track building. So if you have a train on a hack, tracks, you have a track. It features share auctions, track building, upgrading towns, and players calling for dividends whenever they want. I am really looking forward to get to play this one. There is a ton of hype out this. When this was released, it kind of took the uh, the podcasters by storm. Like not even just the train gamers. Everyone seemed to love this one. So as soon as the stay at home order is done, hopefully I can get this one to the table and share more of my thoughts on it. And that was Irish Gage. All right, that's it. That's enough of them. There's all my train games recommendations, but don't leave yet. So we know Sean is specifically looking for next step train games, mm -hmm. but it seemed worthwhile to highlight a few games that are excellent next step games from Ticket to Ride, but that aren't actually train games in any way. So the first one of these is a game called Sync Tear. This is the game when everyone says, tell me about a hidden gen game no one's heard of that you love. It's always Sync Tear. This is the first thing that comes to my mind. This is a pick up and deliver game that features card drafting and contract filling mechanics that are very similar to Ticket to Ride. In Sync Tear, you're driving your cart around the five cities and the surrounding farms of Liguria, Italy, collecting produce and delivering it to those cities to earn points. In addition, though, you're trying to complete produce order cards, which require you to deliver specific fruits to specific cities. There's also a neat... I, economic element here that changes the value of each good between every game for what's and what's wanted at each city using a bunch of six-sided dice that you roll and all it is is if it's a six on the die they pay you six coins for that good if it's a one on the die they pay you one now if it weren't for the train game restriction to sean's question this would have beat out spike this would have been my number one recommendation it's still my number one recommendation of a next step game to ticket to ride but it doesn't have that train out and that was Sync Tail. Next, I have Thurn in Taxis, where you are building post office routes in Bavaria in the surrounding area. Now, this has a ton of train game trappings, but is set far back in history that there weren't any trains. There is no Age of Rail. Now, similar to Ticket to Ride, you're going to draft cards, you're going to attempt to collect sets and form routes of at least three connecting cities. When a set's played, instead of playing down individual trains, you're going to build post offices in those cities along the route. Along with this, there's bonus tiles for having post offices in all the spots in a region, the ability to upgrade your carriages to complete longer routes, and other train game elements. This is actually one of Deanna's favorite games of all time. And that was Thrun and Taxis. Another really interesting route building game that I own is great for people who love to cut other people off in Tick to Try. So if your favorite part is cutting off someone else's route, check out Through the Desert. In this game, players are building routes with their candy colored camels attempting to close off areas of the hex based board. Now, this is a lighter abstract game that could have easily been a train game, though I guess it really is a train of camels you're building. And that was Through the Desert. Finally, I don't think I could have completed this topic without mentioning one of the, I almost say the elephant in the room, and that is Power Grid. While I know a lot of people are intimidated by this game, it is not that hard to learn. This was actually one of the first games I discovered when I first discovered Euro games. I've been playing Games Workshop games for years. I've been a hobby gamer for years. But the, 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 the Euro games, the Catans, the Carcassons, and I was able to learn this without any other experience. I think at that point, I had literally played Catan and Carcassonne, and that's it. That was all I had for it. Uh, the math in this game, everyone's scared of it. Everyone calls it math the game. Ignore that. It's just money math. It, it's paying for auctions and adding up the cost of routes and paying it out of your money. Like it, it, and you use paper money unless you've replaced it with something cooler. Uh, the route building aspects of power, power grid are very train like, and that's because they are completely based off the crayon range system from Empire Builder. Uh, the Friedman Fries, the designer, admitted it. The original prototypes of power grid even had you using crayons to draw on the board to build your network. Now, due to this, many hardcore train game fans consider Power Grid a train game, despite the fact there's no trains in it. Now, I say Power Grid is one of my favorite games of all time. This is a game I think every gamer should try at least once. Not everyone loves it, but it definitely appeals to a broad audience. And that was Power Grid. 
Now that's all we have for today's discussion on Next Step Train Games from Ticket to Ride. And now a review of Rail Pass, a really unique take on pick up and deliver train games. Before we get going, we want to thank Mercury for sending us a copy of Rail Pass to check out. Rail Pass was designed by Tom Green and features artwork from Michael Christopher and Andrew White. It was published by Canadian publishing group Mercury Games in 2019. Rail Pass is a cooperative train game for two to six players. That is, most people agree, best with a full table of six. Now, each round of Rail Pass lasts five to ten minutes, and that's it. In Rail Pass, players control one or more cities. Each city has a color associated with it and starts stocked up with two trains and a bunch of cargo cubes for the of the other colors. Once the timer starts, players will work together by loading their trains, supplying them with an engineer, and passing the trains to the other players, with the goal being to get as many cubes as possible to the correct cities. While doing this, they'll have to make sure their engineers don't get sent too far from home, deal with tunnels and a rail bridge, and watch to make sure they don't spill any cargo, or worse, cause a train wreck. The component quality in this game was way better than expected, mm. as you can see for yourself in our Rail Pass unboxing video on YouTube. Now, pretty much everything here was just a step above what I expect in a board game, especially a train game. The cargo cubes aren't wood. They're actually round plastic with rounded edges. Uh, the engineers are kind of weird looking. They kind of look like golf tees, but they're brilliantly designed so that they're, they're faceted so they won't roll. And the trains are actually chunky and quite heavy plastic. Now, the rules are clear and feature a full component list and plenty of examples. But they are a bit longer than I would have expected. But it ends up trying to describe how to pass loaded trains back and forth just takes more words than you would expect, which you'll get to hear for yourself in the next part of the review. Overall, you just get a lot of stuff in this box that's heavier than you'd expect, and it's of great quality. Well, that's enough about the great components. What are you doing with them in this pick up and deliver game? So when you sit down to play a rail pass, you first choose one of the various setups from the back of the instruction book, which provides two different layouts for every player count. Now it is important to note that all six of these are used every game. Each layout will have you place these six on the board, or sorry, on the table, and then build connections between them. Now these connections can be opened blocked, have a tunnel, or use the train bridge. Next, players will grab a set of arrows for each city and place them on the top or sides of the cities they control, indicating the quickest route to each other color. This is going to help you a lot once the timer starts, as you can quickly see the best way to deliver each good. Next, for each city, you're going to take 20 of the cubes, four in each color other than the city's color and kind of drop them onto the top of your city and then sort them into the shipping yard area at the top of the board. Each city then gets two trains, one silver short train and one gold long train. An engineer of the city's colors is placed in each of these trains and a third engineer is placed on the hotel spot on their board. Each city has two sets of rails. Either rail can fit a smaller silver train, but only the top rail is actually long enough to hold a gold train. This will matter a lot once you start passing trains. Now I have to say, just looking at pictures of this game in play seems really confusing. <laughs> There's a lot there on the table and that can be intimidating to an outside viewer. Mm -hmm. Just looking at a static image of the setup, you could easily think this is much more involved than a 10 minute game. And I will say it is more involved than your average filler game. Like there, there's some meat on this. Uh, th this is not a party game. We'll put it that way. Just because it's a short 10 minute game does not make it a party game, as you can tell from all the components. Now, once everything is set up, you're going to set a timer. This starts at 10 minutes for two players and is one minute shorter for each additional player down to as low as five minutes for a full six players. Note, there's no rail pass app or anything. Uh, the game expects you to own some form of timer in order to play. And note, uh, I did mention this earlier, I don't need it again, but if you have less than six players, some players will control more than one city. You always have all six players and all six colors in play. Now, some folks are, folks are probably going to complain about the lack mm. of an hourglass or a timer, but I think we're at a point now in time where it's hard not to have a timer mm -hmm. around you. 
whether that's a voice assistant, a phone, your microwave, or what have you. And in a game with the sort of concentration involved in this mm -hmm. one, an hourglass is useless. You need a sound to tell you that you're done. Yeah, you want some type of alarm. Or you need a player on the outside of the game ready to tell you to stop who are watching their watch or something. Now, once the timer starts, players then simultaneously, everyone's doing this at once, do a number of things to get the right cubes to the right city. Now, this involves things like loading trains by taking cubes from either end of your shipping yard. So it's a whole row of 20. You can only take from the two ends. And you're going to take them from the board and put them in the trains sitting on your board. Note, you can't load trains you picked up. They have to be what's called in the station. That's on the player board. Cards in your hand are on the rails. Can't load a train on the rails. See, it makes sense. Now, while trains in this station, you can also freely swap cubes between two trains in your station. Now, you can add or swap an engineer, either between trains or from the hotel on the board. Now, the colors of the engineers of your trains matter, as engineers are only willing to travel to adjacent cities. They don't want to be too far from home. If you accidentally send an engineer too far, they will deliver the load for you, but then they quit and are removed from the game. When a train containing car cargo cubes is in a station at a city that matches the cargo's color, you must unload those cubes and deliver them. Finally, you can move or swap a train. To do this, you literally pick up the train and then deliver it to an adjacent city. If this is your own city, you can just place it on the new city spot possibly having to pick up another train and kind of swap them. If another player controls the adjacent city, you must pass them the train. You cannot let go of it until they're holding it. And if there's a train tunnel between you, you actually have to pass the train through the tunnel, uh, going the right way even. And the same thing with the train bridge. You have to actually pass it through the train bridge. One of the things you got to watch for is you can never leave a train sitting on the table like, hey, Sean, this train's for you and put it on the table and do other things. If that happens, it's considered to have been part of a train wreck and all of the cargo, the train and the engineer are removed from the game. Now, you have to also be careful when passing trains because anything that falls during the game is removed from the game. And again, dropping a full train counts as a train wreck. Oh, I almost forgot the most important rule in the game. When you pick up a train, it's now considered on the rails and you must say, doot, doot before handing the train off to anyone else. Not only is this required, it's actually a really good way to get the attention of whoever you want to hand the train to. And I find it's usually toot toot followed by a name or a name then toot toot. Like Grace, toot toot, Grace, toot toot, Grace. Not to mention drawing the attention from everyone at the friendly local gaming store <laughs> you're playing at and getting more folks interested in the game. Very true. Now play continues until the timer runs out. Players then can put any trains in their hands into their stations and deliver any cubes that just arrived of the proper color. So you get to kind of clean up at the end. Then you're going to look at the cubes delivered at each city and find the two cities with the lowest number. You're going to multiply those two numbers together. Then you're going to lose a bunch of points based on anything you drop. The things like the trains are minus five, engineers are minus two, and cargo cubes dropped are minus one each. Your total after this calculation is over if it's over 100 or 100 or over, you're considered that you won. Anything less than that is a failure. Now, I have to say, that's not complex math, but it's still more math than I would have expected yeah. for scoring in a game uh, that's, that's this kind of, again, it seems fun and, and almost party-like. I mean, we, we've already said it's not, but it, it, there's some really strange sort of difficulty versus not difficulty, party yeah. versus not party uh things going on in this game it is a party game for train gamers i think is kind of what it is which is a step above a party game for you know playing with your friends with some drinks <laughs> especially with those spillage rules now if that's not enough for you the rules also include an expert variant now when you get the game it comes with a set of stickers that you're meant to put on the trains uh the short trains get a single a sticker showing one color the long trains have stickers showing two colors you just randomize those the first time you stick them on now, what these represent is reserved spots on the trains. It's supposed to represent that that particular rail company is a contract with that color of good thematically. doesn't. But what it means when you're playing is those spots where the stickers are can only accept cubes of that color, which means there's going to be times where you can't possibly fill these trains before passing them. So you're going to have to send a, an unfilled train to someone else. Now, what this does is greatly increases the difficulty of the game. And I got a feeling most groups are possibly never going to use this rule, except maybe to try it once for laughs. 
All right, well, now that we know how to play, what was your overall impression of Rail Pass? Well, I'm going to step back a bit to go to when I first heard about Rail Pass. Um, I think I found a deal on it on Amazon and I was sharing it on one of my deal accounts. And I was like, what is this game? And I read the back of the box of the Amazon description. I was like, what the heck? This is a pickup and deliver train game where you actually pick up and deliver the trains. That is fascinating. That sounds awesome. I have to see what that is. That just sounds so neat. So I reached out to uh, Mercury Games. Actually, they reached out to me about the 18 shares and 18 coins review, which you can check out on YouTube and on the blog. And I asked, hey, if you're going to send me those, send me Rail Pass 2 because I really want to check it out. They agreed, which is awesome. Thank you, Mercury. So once I got the game and I started unboxing it, I discovered a few things about the game I had completely missed. Uh, again, I think it was an Amazon description, so bad on Amazon. First is how much stuff's in here. Like I pictured a much smaller like almost Yardmaster styles box for people know what I'm talking about. This is a, a, it's not a big box, but it's bigger than I thought. And it is packed and surprisingly heavy. And then everything in it's just really top-notch quality. Now, regarding all that stuff, in the unboxing, you note that the trains are really well packaged. Mm -hmm. Are you going to continue keeping them in bubble wrap or is that really overkill? I've already tossed the bubble wrap. I already tossed the box insert. Um, I do have a certain storage solution I used and everything fits in the box well, nice and sorted. Um, I had Deanna look at them. These are solid trains. Like I, I think it's overkill on their part, but I get it. They're trying to be careful. Um, now I know Mercury is also the company that produces container. And I have seen you, over the years, people complain about chips being broken in container. So maybe they were just a little worried about it. I, I, they seem fine. Like the, the smallest little bits are like the, uh, the smokestack and everything like that. And honestly, if any of those broke off, it wouldn't affect gameplay at all. Plus like they're fairly solid. I have lots of miniatures and toys and games that have shipped with stuff that seems way more breakable than this. Now, the next surprise for me was that this was a cooperative game. I, I, in my head, I, obviously, I didn't go to Board Game Geek and do enough research, right? So in my head, I pictured people passing each other's trains, trying to compete with each other in some way. Now, thinking about it, I don't see how that would have worked, actually. Like, I, I think cooperation is the only way it would have worked. Because otherwise, you'd be like, toot, toot, and you'd be like, no, I'm not taking your train. Or, or you know what? Oh, sorry, I'm full up. I, I can't take your cubes, right? So I'm like, all right, I get it. Yeah, I, I guess it was inevitable. Um, and then the final part is the fact is real time. I really didn't expect. I thought it was going to be like load a train, like everyone take an action, and then I'm passing a train. But again, it makes sense, especially with it being cooperative. Once I put all things together, I honestly can't think of a way to play this not real time or take turns or make it competitive. Now, to our regular listeners and those folks who know Angie Games, you're probably wondering how <laughs> this game could get played enough times to be reviewed. In fact, this game contains most, if not all, all the aspects that she simply doesn't enjoy. Real-time, cooperative dexterity games seems like a three-strikes-and-you're-out mm -hmm. situation. So how did you get it played? Was it all with the kids? So to my and many others, people's complete and utter surprise, I did convince Deanna to try it. She's good to try everything at least once or twice, right? But not only that, she actually really enjoyed it. Uh, to the fact we were talking about it later, about how neat the system was and how well it worked. And I think here we discovered the sushi effect in board games, right? That's where you take a bunch of things that shouldn't work well together, but somehow they do in a magical way to create something wonderful. And I think Rail Pass had the sushi effect on Deanna. All right, well, there you have it, folks. Sometimes you can get enough of a bad thing to make it good. I don't know. Some things just work. Now, as for the kids, uh, I only tried it with them recently and had some mixed results. For one, they they were shocked by the amount of components. Same same thing Sean had, where, where it just looked intimidating. So it took a bit to kind of calm them down and tell them it's okay. And then was describing it to them. They kept like, oh, that's so weird. That's so weird. That's so weird. But you know what? They both got it really well except for a couple little minor things like and they were quickly correct just like no no not this this um but what happened was especially with my youngest she found it overwhelming overall now once she calmed down after a game but like this is a game you're under a lot of pressure and it's the type of thing that she has difficulty with it is uh dealing with lots of pressure and outside and multiple people talking to you, to you at once. So right now I'm thinking it's not the best game for her. She did give it a shot. She played twice. She had a better time the first game, but she didn't the second. Now, whereas my oldest daughter had a much better time in most games. She did have one game, which I'm going to actually talk about later in the show. I won't get into details here. They, they kind of stressed her out a bit, but then we changed things up and she had a much better time the second game. 
So overall, I got to say, uh, with playing with kids with Tiana, Rail Pass exceeded my expectations in almost every way. Like, I had no clue I was going to get such great components in such a small box. And the whole system that Tom came up with is just brilliant, and it works so well. Like, I, I love the fact he included train elements like tunnels and bridges. And it just, the whole thing just works neat and, and it works well and it avoids a lot of the cooperative board game foibles. For example, I can't see how you can really quarterback in this because there's no time. You have far too much to worry about on your own to try to tell some other one, someone else what to do. Unless maybe you get stuck and you're just waiting them to take a train and you pressure them a bit to like, hey, hey, I can't do anything until you take my train. But you're not telling them how to pass their other stuff, right? So there's, there's, I, I wouldn't call that quarterbacking. It's more um, edging on the other players. Now, that requirement of focus does lead me to some potential problems with the game. Because everyone's rushed and so focused on loading, unloading, passing, it's really easy to miss a mistake. Now, the most common of these mistakes is sending an engineer too far. Due to this, I actually think this could be a better game at three to seven players, with one player sitting out and running the game or umpiring. That way they can watch for things like wrong colored cubes delivered to a city or overworked engineers. Now, does this distant a distance aspect uh, for the engineers become more obvious with more players? I can see how it would be hard to notice that with two players, each running three cities in front of them to sort of keep track of which engineer is going too far. I found it with more players. We had more engineers fired, mm -hmm. but that's just uh, arbitrary based on six gameplays. Right. So it's hard to tell if that's an ongoing thing. It's definitely something that's based on player experience. When you play your first round, you are so focused on get the cubes to the right place, you're going to forget. But then there's important rules where if you haven't put the train down, it hasn't reached the station yet, you could pass it back. And at that point, the engineer won't quit because you've sent them back. So I found that as you play more games, you notice that more. So not only are you watching what you ship, the person who gets it is going to do a quick look and go, can this engineer go here? And then, whoa, 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 take it back, two, 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 two. Hey, I don't want this. So it kind of went both ways. So I think it's more based on player experience than the number of players. Right. Now, another issue with being rushed is that you can get frustrated while playing this game. Um, and I've experienced both being frustrated with yourself for not reacting quickly enough or holding up the other players who are waiting to give you trains and trying to figure out how to maneuver the train so you can put this one down to put this down to move this one cube or the opposite where you're getting frustrated with other players because here you are all set with a fully loaded red train and the red players busy looking somewhere else and doing something and they got both their hands filled and you're like come on I, this train's full just take it like I, i'm good to go and you're just sitting there waiting for another player um and this i found especially true for the players playing at the dead end so if you're at a dead end of a round route, every color you're shipping goes out one way. So you just want to load up your tra trains as quick as possible and pass them off. Yeah, you need a couple back with your colors on it, but like you're just sitting there going, come on, it's loaded. Come on, come on, come on, come on. And then you got that person in the middle who's got you going, come on, come on, come on. And the person on the other side going, hey, I have stuff for you or hey, to give me that, right? So you just kind of hate it going from both sides. And due to that, this isn't going to be a game for everyone. I, anyone who doesn't handle that kind of stress well um, isn't going to like this game. Now, this is one of the concerns Deanna had. And during one of our plays where she made a couple of mistakes that got her frustrated on early on and she was frustrated with herself, just made things worse. Like when she was frustrated, just led to more mistakes and she was getting more frustrated. She honestly said that if I was playing with other gamers, I probably would have been so embarrassed I might have quit playing after that. But we were playing with the kids, so it was okay. Similarly, like I said earlier, this game was ended up being a bit too much for my youngest to handle, at least for now. Like when she first played, she kind of got it, but we had her playing two adjacent cities. But then once we started paying attention, she was trading them, treating it as one city. So like she'd get a train from this side and deliver it to that city, but she actually can't do. There's supposed to be a divider in between them. So while she got the concept of the game and she got to the point where she like she was done after her second game it was i don't like this game i'm done i did talk to her after she calmed down she's like it's neat i'd try it again but definitely not for her okay. now the other part of rail pass that i found a bit annoying is just how long it takes to set up this game especially the first round when you just broke it out of the box for a game night because there are a lot of components to start out at the start 
And then there's the fact you have to make up six sets of cubes. Each was has to be missing one of the colors so that you can drop them on your board. And then you're sorting through 120 cubes. And that is not quick. And I got to say that I, like the best word for this is inelegant. Like you're literally dropping cubes and then kind of trying to fit them into squares. It just feels like there could be a better system for that, though I don't know what it is. Like I don't have a solution for stocking the shipping yard, but I do have a strong suggestion to use when cleaning up the game. So it's quicker to set up and get playing next time. That is to sort each city's bits in its own container. Now I use these plastic containers that air dry clay comes in. Uh, my kids get to play with the clay and then I get a bunch of board game component storage containers. Now Ziploc bags would work or really any other small container would also suffice. I particularly prefer these because they're actually dirt cheap once you work it out. Now, what you're going to do is you are going to put in three engineers of one color, then four of each other colored cube, and also one complete set of arrows, which we actually tested today, and it ends up they fit two in these. So if you need a container, they'll fit all that. This way, the next time you play, you just hand that container to the person who has that color, and their dump onto their thing is just dumping the container. All right, well... Of course, we all know no one likes cleaning up and sorting on the back end, mm -hmm. even though it's important to what makes setting up a game and getting it to the table faster the important part. Now, one amusing thing we did learn, uh, this was going into our, our sixth play of the game, we, we discovered this, is the better you do in the game, the easier it is to not only put away, but to start another round. Because while well, the whole goal is to get cubes of the same colors to cities. So at the end, every city should have a nice pile of the same color cubes sitting there ready to sort. So I thought that was amusing that, that there's your encouragement to play better and do good is it's going to make the game easier. Now, saying that, it's also probably worth noting that this game can be hard, especially with new players. And it seems to get harder the more players you have. Now, I expect a cooperative game to be hard. You don't want an easy cooperative game. And even after a couple plays, you will notice you get better at managing everything in real class. I honestly think after four, three, four plays, you could probably even move up to the advanced rules. It just takes knowing what you need to process and what's prioritized. You, you won't get that your first game. It takes a couple plays to get it. Now, the base mechanics you're going to get, this isn't like an eminent domain where there's this high learning curve to the game. It's just getting used to how you need to think to get this game to work. Now, the final surprise for me with Rail Pass was how well this game plays with only two players. With two players, you each control three cities, and I expected that to be overwhelming, but it wasn't because it does seem odd at first, but you're passing trains to yourself and there's no one else to wait on. And you can do a lot of quick swaps really quickly to get cubes into the right place. I actually think it's kind of neat too that they didn't put any tunnels or bridges between a single player cities. Because while you are passing yourself, having to pass yourself through a tunnel would just seem weird. And now while it's not mentioned in the rules, I actually think you could play this game solo. Seeing how many cubes you can deliver on your own and seeing what score you can get. But again, you don't want to pass it through bridges and tunnels to yourself. Though you'd have to handle all six cities and the odds of managing the conductors without those mistakes seems lower. I still think it could be done. I think it'd be an interesting challenge. I, th I think it can be done. I don't know if a score of 100 is possible. <laughs> we'll see. Now, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, I didn't get the try rail pass with the full six players. I'm limited to people in my immediately, my immediately, my immediately family, my immediate family, which is four. Now I will say the game definitely gets much more chaotic and much more loud with more players. And I got to say in a way, that was a cool thing. It was a neat thing. And I think that's going to be a real blast with six, especially in a public play at, uh, type of atmosphere, right? I am looking forward to trying this out with six players. And when I do, I'll be sure to share my thoughts on that on our Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast when it happens. This does seem like a great game for game night FLGS style game or event game. As mm -hmm. the hurried pace and the excitement of calling out toot toot along yes. with that dexterity aspect and table presence really is a big aspect to any successful public play game. Yeah, this should be on any list of games with good table presence, especially if you use the train bridge. The train bridge just kind of solidifies it. Without You can play without the train bridge. It's just not quite the same. You throw that train bridge out there and people are immediately like, oh, wait, train, what's going on? You have trains? 
what I find strange about this game is I have heard very little about this Canadian board game since its release. Like no one's talking about this. I don't think I've heard it mentioned on a single podcast. Now I realize it, it, it's newer. It's, it's not necessarily new hotness, but like 2019, it's not an old game at this point. I, at this point, right, I would say Rail Pass qualifies as a true hidden gem train game. The next time someone's asked me, what's a hidden train game? I'm going to be like Sync Terror and Rail Pass. Those are two games no one's ever heard of. I think there's a lot to like about Rail Pass, and it's going to appeal to a broad range of gamers. It's a totally new take on train games and pick up and deliver games, which is a refreshing surprise. If you're a cooperative game fan and want something different than point-based movement and collecting sets of cards to remove cubes, I strongly suggest taking out Rail Pass. If you thrive on real-time games and like games like Fuse or Escape, you are going to love Rail Pass. Now, if you're a train game fan and want to see the train game themes pick up the liver and move in engines used in a unique way, I'd take a moment and check out Rail Pass if you can. Now, where this is not going to work is for players who get stressed out by pressure, especially the type where more than one person is demanding your attention at the same time. Because once you get past two players in Rail Pass, there's always at least one player at the table dealing with two or more sides players coming at them from two or more sides now that said based on my wife's reaction even if you hate real-time games dexterity games cooperative games or games that cause you stress you may just find that rail pass combines those in a way that's more fun and engaging than you might expect though try before you buy don't rush out and buy this one if you don't think you'll enjoy it I personally can't wait to play this game some more. I'm really looking forward to when we can gather together uh, in public and I can get this to a table with a full group of six or maybe even seven so we can have someone watch and make sure we're not cheating with those engineers. Well, that's it for our look at Rail Pass from Mercury Games. Be sure to check out the written review over at the blog at tabletopbellhop.com for an even more in-depth look at this really unique train game. And now the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. So this past week, I actually got a couple of new games to the table. Well, sort of new games. See, this past weekend, we celebrated our anniversary, and Deanna picked us up some new things to play, which included the Crystal Mosaic expansion for Azul. As I've noted before on the show, Deanna generally would prefer to play games she knows rather than learn something new, so she thought an Azul expansion would be perfect for her anniversary game night. Unfortunately, though, it seems it's been too long for her since playing Azul, as two rounds in, I did notice she had tiles of the same color in the same row. So we did have to take a few minutes to reteach the rules. Honestly, I think I would need a refresher as well. It has been a long time. Yeah, we that was like 2019 again, I think, by the time. Yep. Silly, uh, the quarantine. Now, thankfully, as far as Crystal Mosaic goes, there really isn't really any new stuff to learn. This expansion comes with some new two-sided boards, one of which has an X pattern right in the middle of five tiles, one of the each, each of the five tiles of the tiles. The game's played as normal, but the end game scoring and tile breaking penalties are worth different points with completed rows and columns being worth significantly more points. Now, the other side of the board has, again, one of each color already on the board, but kind of in a staggered pattern. And each of these says 2x on it. And what the rules are is when you play a tile on one of these spots, you get double the points. And again, the broken tile penalties are less on this board than the original. So, well, lower broken tile penalties aren't a bad thing at all. Those can always be brutal yes. in any game of Azul. <laughs> There's no uh, minus 14 points anymore. It's interesting to note your first one's minus one, your next one's zero. So taking that second tile doesn't hurt you at all. Then I think it's minus two, then zero again. Like, it's interesting. Like, it, there's definitely a little more thought process on, hey, I can let a couple of these breaks. They're not worth that much. Hmm. Now, we did try both these boards. We enjoyed both these boards. Um, now, we've only tried each once. So my opinion of them may change after more plays. But I will say that using these is... Uh, much thinkier way harder than even the blank side of the baseboard which is deceptively simple seeming you're like oh this will be easy no it's not these are worse <laughs> it is far easier to mess yourself up and end up with unplayable tiles and rows and columns you will never complete due to putting a tile into the wrong spot with both of these boards 
Right. Well, at the same time, there's no real point in putting it out if it isn't going to add something to the complexity. So it's to be expected that they've uh, you know ramped it up some. Now, along with the new boards, Crystal Mosaic comes with something else that I think is what most people really care about, and that are is overlays for your boards. And these are designed so that the scoring cubes and the tiles won't move if the board gets bumped. Now, when I first saw these, I got to say I was instantly disappointed uh, to the fact that I'm like, man, I wish I had done an unboxing video so people could have heard me going, what? What is this? I honestly, I don't know why, thought these were like a nice sit set of laser cut acrylic overlays the kind that many people have put out on etsy for years and i actually thought it was kind of weird that plan b games was putting out something to compete with those but i was like i guess they'd rather make the money than some stranger on etsy but what you're getting instead is a set of very thin plastic that volt vacuum molded plastic um that's basically what you expect in box inserts or even like like covers on things i i don't know i just i, I thought it'd be better now, that said, after playing two games, they were fine. Like, I, I liked them quite a bit. Um, they had a couple minor issues. Um, for one, the score track is divided up by every two points. So your cube can pretty easily slide between two numbers. So I was a little disappointed if it gets bumped. But two numbers is way better than I have no idea what my score is, I guess. The second thing is they decided to do some indentations, cut in things that didn't need to be cut in like the Azul symbol, but that doesn't really matter. More importantly, though, is the end game scoring parts, which normally I have memorized from the base game, but they changed them in this expansion, so I actually needed to see them. And due to reflections, I actually found the end game scoring bits almost impossible to read with the overlays, unless I like got it right at the right angle or just took them off. Now, I will admit, part of this is due to the pot lights in my game room, Regardless, I did find it annoying. Plus, why? Why did they even bother etching anything there? Like, it could have just been flat and see-through. Overall, despite not being what I expected, these trays are pretty nice. Yeah, I do wish we could redo the lighting in your basement completely, but that's for a different time and a different topic. Now, the other expansion we got was the Emergence of Psy Pluto expansion for Space Base, but we decided to keep that one in the box for now, and instead broke out my recently delivered copy of Gorinto from Grand Gamers Guild, funded on Kickstarter. Now, if you've been shit listening to our show long enough, you know we are all big fans of Gorinto when I was checking out the prototype copy that Mark Spector sent us. Now, at the time, I felt this was the best modern abstract game since Azul, and I couldn't wait to check out the production copy. Having now played the production copy, I stand by that assessment. Gorinto is an amazing tile drafting and placement game that we still love. The plastic tiles in the final version of the game are extremely well made and stacked beautifully. The other component upgrades, uh, since the prototypes are also welcome, though I would still love to see a deluxe, deluxe board where the tiles slot on the board, but I get it. It's probably way too expensive. I still like what you get with Gorinto. And it's so great to hear that this game has stood up and, in fact, gotten stronger from the early mm -hmm. preview we got our hands on uh, a while back. Yeah, in the last while, I've actually taken to started calling Garinto the Azul Killer, and I'll put the Azul Killer hashtag whenever I'm talking about it right now. And while well, Saturday night, we put this to the test, right? We literally played two games of Azul and then broke out Garinto, and we both had more fun playing Garinto than Azul. Now... That is not to say Azul is bad in any way. And to be honest, Crystal Mosaic made it felt fresh and interesting too. So it's not even like we were tired of Azul. But we just found the way Garinto works to be more engaging and enjoyable. And it turns out you're not the only one with the idea about Azul as being, yes. uh, Garinto being an Azul killer, as you discovered in the BGG forums as well. Yeah, there was a really interesting thread that it started off with, uh, is Gorinto an Azul killer? And a lot of people who agreed with me, though they didn't agree with me because they didn't know they were talking to me, but I am not the only one. That's all I will say. And even Deanna is in the chat room right now saying, I love Azul, but Gorinto is so good. And that's it. So our first game of Gorinto, we just played by the standard two-player rules, um, using the option where you get to choose what tiles move from the game. Um, on your second and third turn. So that is something that's new in this version. In the original prototype, that's how you play by default. What they've included in these are Kitsune, which is a, a fox spirit in Japan. Kitsune tiles where you can randomize what tiles were moved. And that's actually the default two player. But we found the old way really strategic, so we stuck with it. Now that, it played like a Rinto. It was great. We loved it. Now the next game, we tried out one of the new variant rules. 
Now, these did not exist anywhere in the prototype, and they're honestly not even in the rule book. And I'm not sure if it's a Kickstarter thing or if this is going to come in the pro in the in the the uh, production reveal what, what is it? Retail. retail. That's the word. Yes, or coming in the retail version. It's a little card that tells you a variant. I'm going to assume it's in all of them. Now, this variant was called Seasons of Change. And Sean, you played this, so you'll know how this works. At the start of the game, you always deal out two scoring cards, and that's what scores throughout the whole game in a normal game. Well, this time you deal out four. Two go on the scoreboard, just like normal, and two go below it. At the end of each season, you're going to score what's on the scoreboard, but then you're going to rotate the cards, sliding them down. So the bottom card jumps to the vacant spot at the top. So what happens is over your four seasons, each scoring card is going to get used twice. This added a significant level of long-term planning to what's already a strategic plan ahead kind of game. Like you are constantly trying to adjust your stacks, your knowledge in the five elements to try to be ready for the next scoring thing that was going to come up, but make sure you're still going to score the ones that were still there. Now, admittedly, you also did run into one tiny mm -hmm. thing that could be upgraded. In fact, these wonderful tiles that we've said so much about actually stack too nicely. Yes. And so that it's hard, becomes hard to see how many are in a stack because of how well they all yes. come, sit together. Yeah, I almost I almost wish they were flared out at the bottom and then you get a little shadow or something. And what I recommended to Mark at Grand Gamers Guild, because he's actually been really good, but there, there are some rule enhancements that ended up in the final version based on our playing of the prototype, which is awesome. I didn't see my name in the credits though, Mark. Uh, anyway, what I, what I recommended was just a strip of paint around the bottom of every tile. Like, I don't know, you, you wouldn't dip it. It'd be printed that way. Like they're already putting printing on the tiles. It's just a strip of paint down the edge. And then you would be able to easily count how many lines were there. Right. Especially with the red. Like I've got a picture of just a red stack and like, you can't count the lines. <laughs> it's a solid. Uh, it, it's like a solid tube, tower. Right. Now, really what I want to do with Grinto is show it off. That's, that's I, I feel oh, I'm like, Oh, I can't go show other people this game. Like I, yes, I, I I'm a fanboy. No, they're not paying me for this. They, I got a review copy. That's it. I, I just, it's so good. I, I want to share this with more people. I want to have a Garinto night at um, CG Realm. It, well, I want to make sure they can get copies. Then I want to have a Garinto night at CG Realm because that's the only thing I could see happening is we're going to do this and just frustrate people that they can't get copies. Now, the last game we did play this past week were multiple rounds of Rail Pass. Um, two rounds with both kids, four players, and two rounds with three players. And each time we swap the layout. So at this point, we have tried all of the two player, three player, and four player setups, which leads me to one part of this game I didn't actually mention in the review earlier, which is just how much these layouts can impact a game. Now, I want to bring up a specific example from earlier today. And this is with the two three player layouts. One is called straight. It's a U shape with two dead ends. The dead ends each lead to one city, which then lead to two central cities that are connected to each other. Now, two players control the dead end of the adjacent city. So all they have to worry about is those two at the, the end of the use. Then the third player controls the ones in the middle. Now, for the end players, it's, it's pretty simple. You're just pushing cubes towards the center. And yeah, you got, okay, the one city in the middle does have to push one color back. But most of the time, it's dump everything this way. And then you have someone on the other side who's dumping everything that way. And then you have one player sitting in the middle dealing with trains coming from both sides as well as having to push trains out to both players. And I'm sorry, but I challenge anyone not to be overwhelmed and stressed playing that spot with three players. In one play, with Grace in that spot, made her start reconsidering a game she thought she loved. She The first two plays we played, she was like, oh, this is really neat, it's really cool, I never played anything like this, to I don't know if I like this game anymore. Yeah, it you really need to be both sure-handed and be able to multitask strongly for that role if you're if you're stuck in the middle of the yeah the... now thankfully um grace is pretty level tempered most of the time and instead of giving up she was up for giving it one more game trying the other three player layout and i think part of that is that's the one she wanted to try first anyway so i think it was a told you so moment which happens with teenagers it's mostly the same you've got the same you you got the same cities in the same place but the end of that you is connected so there's no dead end. Instead, I am now connected to the player across from me. And it's a circle. And actually, the, the layout's called circle now. We played using this map and got the highest score we've ever gotten in a game of Rail Pass. We were literally three cubes away from delivering every single good. 
Now we did screw up and three engineers got fired. So it's not like we would have had a perfect score, but like we had like 400 and some points. It was, th this was the thing I'm like, okay, maybe I will try the advanced rules in this game at some point soon. Cause we nailed that. This setup was just so much easier and better balanced per player. Like no one player had the focus on them. And we were able to do our own thing and swap our own stuff and could easily wait. If one player was too busy, you could deal with the other player. It just played so much smoother. Yeah. So clearly how you set up is important to think about when you're looking at your player composition. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will note that I, I checked out the forums on this uh, on the game on BGG where the uh, designer Tom is very active. Um, and he really sort of encourages people to come up with their own yeah. layouts and their own designs. So once you've, you've had your flail and you fill and, and played some of the concepts in the game, you know, he really encourages you to just try building your own design mm -hmm. and your own layouts and, and figure out how to do things. Yeah. And that is recommended right in the rule book. It is in there. So here are some layouts to try out. Now, another note about Rail Pass, I think is worth mentioning specifically on this podcast and for fans of the show, is that due to the added chaos and confusion playing with more players, Deanna has decided she only really enjoys the game a lot at two players. Once you get up to three, she found it much less enjoyable, and she found four players to actually be a bit overwhelming. Well, she'll still play. It's not like, oh, this is terrible. I won't play it, which is like if I try to get her to play Fuse, which can find some of these elements, it's never going to happen. She's not going to suggest playing this one with more than two players. This isn't going to be a go-to game for her going forward. So that is a change from last week's report on this game. But she still did enjoy it with two. All right. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? Well, we, we did a series. We, we did two topics in a row, which is kind of neat. I almost feel like I want to talk about trains again, just because we got like a thing going here. Uh, I, I had, had a bunch of games I wanted to make sure to get played, and I got all of them played that I could. There, there is one there. I really wish we could have played Irish Gage, but we don't have the players. And like now I'm like, I'm lost. Well, what do I do now? We, we're done with the trains. So I honestly right now don't have anything specific planned for our review the next week. So I think it's going to depend on what Deanna and I feel like playing. Uh, I do know we both want to get Great Western Trail back to the table, but that's also not an obligation game. And I think it might be time to look at that pile of obligation, find the oldest game on there and just hammer through it and get it done. Now, the other thing that I'd noticed uh, Sean brought up is Magical Kitty Save the Day is doing really well on Kickstarter right now. And I'm wondering if I might want to jump on that train and get that review out. So there's a good chance I could probably, I've been reading the rule book. I'm almost done it. It's not a complicated game. My kids are looking forward to it. I could easily do a read review now, but I think I'd like to do a review with a thing. So we might be throwing some magical kitties up next week, just to, like I said, ride the, ride the hype train. <laughs> yeah. And I'm probably mostly out of commission for another week or so with yeah. work obligations, though I'm, I'm hoping I may try and, and squeeze in some Duke with my son this weekend if I get a chance. Nice. I haven't played the Duke in a long time. Yeah, and I, I actually was, was sorting through a bookshelf and, and there was the Duke sitting there. Yeah. And I'm like, no, we, we haven't played that in a while. And my son loves that game. So. And I got to admit, I am really tempted to like, all right, train game night. Like, like seriously, let, let's start with, I don't own Transamerica or, or I, and you know what I said? I own 20th Century Limited. I sold it. It was too easy for me. But the same reason I don't play Pick a Ride. Just didn't have, have enough depth, but I'm like, start with the lightest, like start with Chicago Express, then move to German Railways, oh, then see, move to First Train. Really like, go, go historical. So start with, uh, start with the crayon. <laughs> And, well, uh, <laughs> yeah, see, I could sit and, yeah, but then I got to learn, like, to be honest, I'd have to relearn any of those games behind me, but I at least vague idea of how to play them, right. especially after redoing the research for today. <laughs> Transamerica, uh, we played Transamerica at the Rio Grande booth at Origins, and it, it was just too simple. It was, you're, you're just building routes, and it's all, do you try to connect, like, there was some neat stuff. It's, it's more of an abstract game than a train game. I know we're saying every game's a train game. Like, yeah, you're building roads, but it, I could have been building roads of anything. It could have been a circuit board. Right. Whoever connects all your resistors at once wins, right? It is a really simple, really neat game. I like it. It just, I would I rather play that or play something else? I, most of the time, I'd rather play something else. Right. All right. Now a quick shout out and thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Andrew Dacey, thank you. Diane Tuzano, thanks, Ma. Misdirected Mark, join the Misdirected Mark team every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern right here on Twitch. I actually joined uh, the last couple shows. No, not, not yesterday. I didn't make yesterday's, but actually I was on and I was impressed to see they've, they've improved their quality a little bit. 
Joe Swick, Papa Swick, I think uh, DNA Phil used to call you. I don't know if we can get away with that, but thanks, Joe. Evil John, looking forward to playing through the second half of The Crew with you. Really am. Well, that was the double bell. That means our shift is coming to an end. We're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. As always, if you like the content we have been providing and dig this show, it would be awesome if you chose to support our continued efforts. Please consider tipping your bellhops at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And And game game on. on.